take the picture. <laughs> So some of the some issues that we encounter are exposure issues. Um, this particular photo was taken in very low light, but it was with a, a camera, so it just turned out so much better. If I had taken this same photo with my phone, I probably would have just had a blur of a head because he moves so quickly. And and honestly, he's a lazy dude, so <laughs> like. Even if I, if it blurs a lazy guy, then you know it'll blur mm -hmm. fast moving pets. Um, some other oh low light yeah that's what we were talking about. Um, I consider low light indoor without direct sunlight. You know if sunlight is directly coming in the windows, that's not necessarily low light. But oftentimes low light is considered um, indoors in a restaurant. I know you don't take your pets to a restaurant, but some people don't have the same expectation when we're talking about low light and so that's what i'm talking about um pets with mixed color fur so that's difficult um like say you're one of the best examples i have for this is is photographing a bald eagle i know that we don't have bald eagles as pets but <laughs> it's hard to expose for the white head and the the really dark brown feathers so my my best advice there is to, depending on what uh, mode you, you prefer to shoot in, um, but let's say you're shooting an aperture priority and you have every, you know, your aperture the way you want to like an F4 or something like that. Um, you can use exposure compensation to change that. And since what you see is what you get, you can see that in real time. Um, I would also say as a general rule, it is, you can, overexposed just slightly with a digital camera because you can pull those highlights back down. Um, I was always taught, because I come from film, um, that you underexpose if something is, is harder to expose for. And you can bring that, those highlights, or those, um, sorry, <laughs> the shadows back out and you can get more detail there. Um, but nowadays, it is kind of the opposite. So I would say perhaps overexposed just slightly for that with pets, pets with mixed color, like, like a Dalmatian. Um, <laughs> can can I chime in on something there? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Shelly did just mention exposure compensation and for, uh, for the people who are just starting out with their cameras, they might not be familiar with that term yet. And so I just want to, uh, you know, d define that really quickly. Uh, auto exposure compensation is a really, really easy tool built into every Olympus camera whereby you can sort of override what the camera thinks is the correct exposure. Um, so, you know, cameras always go for a, a middle gray type tone, and that's not always the best uh, exposure basis. So with the Olympus cameras, uh, they've always got a, a small dial that's really easy to use. And as Shelly already mentioned, what you see is what you get in the Olympus viewfinder. So as you tweak the exposure uh, to make the image either brighter or darker, you see it right away so you know what you're going to get. So playing with exposure compensation uh, in program mode or shutter priority or aperture priority is a really, really great tool. And how easy uh, Olympus makes it to use is just invaluable. So using exposure compensation with your pets or whatever your subject is, um, I, I really believe they make it so easy to use because they intend for you to use it frequently. So find out how your camera does apply exposure compensation and take advantage of that. Definitely. It's a very, it's a very good tool to use when you need it. Okay. Um, so some recommended gear that we have here at Olympus. I would say just about any of our cameras will do well. Just about Every single one of our cameras will do well with that photography. Um, the higher up you go, the more manual controls you have. Um, you have manual control on everything, but there's there's just a lot more advanced options, like on the EM1X, the EM1 Mark II, <coughs> EM1 Mark III. Um, and then there's a lot of different lenses that you can choose from. So. There, depending on different um, 
situations, you might want a, a different kind of lens. Like I would prefer personally, a, like this 45 1.2 prime lens or the 45 1.8. I actually use that 45 1.8 a lot for portraits of pets because um, it's so small. It is. Um, I've got it right here, Shelly. I do too. Look at how cute it is. So this wait, 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 where did my, oh, there it is. Yes. <laughs> Oh my God, it disappears on me. There we go. The 4518, it's so tiny. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, small but mighty. This thing is gorgeous for portraits. Let's in a lot of light. Um, and that, I, that is actually one thing that I didn't mention on a couple of slides ago is how small and compact our gear is. You can just take it anywhere. I take this with me everywhere I go even if I'm going to the grocery store, which I'm not doing right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm staying home. Um, yeah, other things, like uh, I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself talking about where, where these go, but there, what I do want to say is there are, I feel like there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people that like to zoom with a lens and people that like to frame more with a prime lens and zoom in and out with their feet, like okay. moving in and out. Um, can, can I point out one more distinction between mm -hmm. the bodies too? Yeah. Uh, well, because we are talking about, you know, our pets and if, specifically if we're talking about dogs, you spend a lot of time outside with them. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's not always sunny out. So I always, I'm so happy always telling any customer I can, that both the EM5 bodies and the EM1 bodies are all weatherproof. Mm -hmm. So if you do go out with your dog on a muddy, rainy, messy day, you know, with an EM5 or an EM1 or an EM1X and a bunch of their pro lenses, you are really going to, well, you won't have anything to worry about. That's a really good point because that also opens up your opportunities for more creative photos. Because if, if your dog likes to go splash in the mud, you can get some cool splashing photos. And you don't have to worry about getting your camera, you know, wet. It's just, it's fine. Um, you can, if, let's say, a little splash of mud got on your camera, you can literally wash it off with water with, in the faucet. You can't submerge it. <laughs> you can just rinse it off and it's fine. You dry it off before you take the lens off. But um, it is truly the best weather ceiling on the market. Yeah, that's a good point. Awesome. Um, yeah. And I, I do see too, Shelly, that, that you pointed out the, uh, the TG6 on your list here as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just speak about that briefly? What, 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 which camera is that? The TG6 is part of our tough series cameras. It is considered a point and shoot, but um, that phrase that I said earlier was small and mighty. It's right here, actually. So it looks like this. It has a five time zoom built in, so you can zoom in and out with it. But what's cool about this camera is it has a 2.0 um, aperture, so it gathers a lot of light in the lens, but you could submerge this in water. It's waterproof and it's drop proof if you drop it from seven feet it's rated to maintain like intact totally fine um aside from like pet photography it has a microscope mode so it can get it can focus within a centimeter of a subject so you can get really really super close macro shots which is why i have this little accessory on it this is a an led light guide which works really well for that kind of thing because you would cast a shadow if you were that close to something potentially um, it is, it's very fast and it's just a cool little camera to have with you. So. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, that just gets me thinking, you know, if, if you do have a dog that likes water that chases the ball and goes and splashes in the water when it's warm or my dog does not like water. Um, but you could get those cool shots of the, of the dog in the water, you know, half underwater, half not underwater. Those are always cool that shots. Would be very, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what Lynn's suggestion for inside versus a dog park? So I think that there's a lot of different answers to that, just depending on how you like to shoot, 
Um, so I'll kind of go over that. Inside, I would say, if you like zoom lenses, the, there's a four that I would recommend, the 12 to 40, 2.8, 12 to 45 F4, which is one that we just came out with. It's a wonderful lens, very small and compact. Um, and the 12 to 100 F4. Um, and the primes, I shoot a lot with the 17 millimeter because it gives me about a 35 millimeter uh, angle of view. Of view. Huh? <laughs> I said angle of view. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> my brain was paused for a second there, I guess. Um, I just personally really like that angle of view. Um, and 25, 1.8, 1.2, 45, 1.8, 1.2, these gather a lot of light. They have the capability of gathering more light than a zoom lens, just based on the nature of them being primes. They're, they're able to let more light in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to point out too, for again, for, for the, the photographers with less experience, that the value of that prime lens with the fast aperture is not only that it lets in a lot more light, but it does give you that much more shallow depth of field too. So if you oh, yeah. do want, you know, uh, the dog's eyes to be nice and sharp with their nose to be soft, you're going to be able to get that more easily with a prime lens than with a zoom lens. Right? Absolutely. You're right. <laughs> um, I did mention on here a couple of other lenses, 75, 1.8. That would be quite zoomed in for um, indoors. I put it on there just because it is a beautiful portrait lens and if you have enough space, it, it might work for what you're, you're doing. And then there's an eight millimeter fisheye 1.8, which is very fun to play with. I think that fisheye lenses can be fun for pets. Not something that you would probably want all of the time your portraits, unless that was just your style. But um, it does have the capability, since, since it is a fisheye, it has very curved edges. Um, but in our cameras, you have the capability to uh, defish it. I don't know if that's the official way to say it, but you can, uh, it has rectilinear correction in it, so it straightens the lines, and it's still very wide. It's actually a really cool look. But the, the fisheye, you know, kind of gives it that fun. If you put the fisheye right up on the nose of the dog, then the nose looks huge and stuff, so looks disproportional. And um, if you wanted to shoot your dogs in, like running around outside in the dog park, I would recommend something, um, my first recommend recommendation is something wide to telephoto because if the dog is going to be nearby you, you need to zoom out very quickly and have a wide angle. Um, and you can quickly zoom out if the dog runs away. So you have so much versatility with the 12 to 200 or 12 to 100. Um, if you know for, oh, and the 14 to 150, that would also be a good um, wide to telephoto. Then there's others, the 40 to 150 2.8. I love that lens. It's great for portraits as well. It's great for outside action. You can add a 1.4 2x teleconverter on there and add more length to it. And then the 300 f4 is a brilliant lens. It's that's the equivalent of 600 millimeter on our cameras, which means it is, a, I mean, it's very zoomed in, if it's one way to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also add the teleconverters on those as well. That one would be, it might not be exactly great for in a dog park. I think that it was like the 40 to 150 would probably be more of a versatile lens for that, but I do really like that lens. Um, 75 to 300, which is a very small zoom lens, very powerful, great for outdoors and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is the 40 to 150R you have listed there? That one is, so it's the same distance as the, or uh, focal range as the 40 to 150 2.8, but it does have a variable aperture, which is, um, I believe, 4 to 5.6. I don't have it sitting here with me right now. That, that, that sounds right. I, I've got a copy of that lens, I know. That, that sounds right. Yeah, so when it's, when we, when I say a variable aperture, that means it, the widest the aperture can open up is 4 on the wide end, which mm -hmm. is, would be on the 40 
in. And then when you zoom out to 150, the widest it's going to open up is at 5.6. Um, and it's a very small, compact light lens. It's about, maybe it's about as big as this, a little bit smaller than that, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I, I own the 40 to 150 2.8 and the 40 to 150 4 to 5.6. You know, because it just depends when I'm going out uh, for a walk in the woods. Maybe I don't necessarily want to carry around the weight of the 2.8 lens. So I'll mm -hmm. just take the variable aperture with me. It is so small and lightweight and sharp. It's a good little lens. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great little lens. Small but mighty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some recommendations.